Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on serverless computing. My name is Bell McCoy, and it's my pleasure to introduce two of our Red Hat rock stars. We have Steve Tran and John Keem with us today. A little background on our presenters. Steve has a master's in computer science from American University. He has been with Red Hat for over 10 years and is currently a principal consultant. He is also a Red Hat certified architect. John has a degree in computer engineering from Virginia Tech, and he ran his own consulting firm for over 10 years before joining Red Hat as one of our solution architects. Just a few logistics before we get started. If you have any questions during the session, please submit them in the chat window and we'll try to cover them at the end of the session or make a point to follow up with you afterward. Also, a recording of this session and all the sessions today will be available after the event on YouTube, so you can have an opportunity to benefit from all the useful information being shared today. And after the session, we encourage you to join us for a live chat during the break on the main stage for some live dialogue with some of our Red Hatters. And with that, I'll turn things over to John to kick things off. John? All right. I'm actually going to turn it over to Steve, and then we're going to bounce back, but nice to see y'all. Uh, Steve, I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Hey, can you hear me now? Hey, let me know if you can hear me, anybody. You're good. Good? Okay. All right, sorry about that. A little technical difficulties, but, um, you know, welcome and thanks for tuning in today to learn about serverless computing. We are really excited to talk about this because we think this is a tool that everyone needs to keep in their toolbox because for the right type of problems, um, serverless is going to be the best solution, but this presentation is not about convincing you all to change everything to serverless or trying to adopt a serverless first mindset. Uh, no, we're, we're here to give you enough information to make your own decisions as to when and how you should apply serverless. So for today, we've got some slides of what the technology is, the pros and cons of it, and we're going to share some lessons learned from the field when implementing it with customers. And then in the, in the second half, we're gonna get hands-on with a live demo to actually build and deploy an, app, an application completely from scratch. So, and then whatever time we've got left, we'll do some Q and A. So a little bit about us. So my name is Steve Tran and as a principal consultant, I get to work with a lot of different customers from all different types of industries. And I get really deep into the trenches with customers, um, getting uh, hands-on on keyboard time with them to solve whatever problems they're facing. And just like most people here, I'm a developer. I'm very passionate about things that improve developer joy. And I just love learning about new and open source technologies. And um, John, you wanna do your quick intro? All right. Hello. My name is John Keem. I think the intro at the top was pretty good, but ideally uh, thinking about where organizations are and how they can use or get to the cloud or have solutions that are both spanning the cloud and on-prem, that multi-hybrid cloud scenario, uh, we look to see how we can, or I specifically look to see how we can map that to technology and how we can use open source, particularly open source technology, to solve that. Yeah, so put things in context today, like like what is serverless? What are we talking about really? All right, I'm glad you asked, Steve. All right, so serverless is a word that we use and kind of throw around a lot. And depending on who you're talking to, it can mean different things. So it's for today, wanted to lay it all out there, define it, what it is, what it isn't, um, and really kind of dispel some of those stuffs. So first, a, ser a system with no servers. So an analogy I like to use is the wireless analogy, wireless internet. 
You think about you for the end user using the internet, there are no wires, but it doesn't mean there's no wires everywhere, right? There's wires somewhere that are making it all work for you, but for you, the end user, no wires. So it's the same thing for serverless. For you, the end user, the developer here in this scenario, you are not concerned with the, store, the server. You are just simply deploying your app and the infrastructure, those concerns are moved elsewhere. So with that in mind, is it the best architecture for everything? Well, no, it's not. You're not gonna write all your future apps using this approach and you're not gonna go back and rewrite all your other existing apps and refactor it into serverless. But for certain use cases that we're gonna to discuss today, it is a great fit and solves a really nice problem really well. So again, what it is, is it's system where the server concerns are moved to the infrastructure. Okay, so we can see how we even came up with this concept of serverless. Where did this come from? How did this evolve? You know, if you look back in the older days, you know, we had a lot of monoliths. Monoliths aren't necessarily a bad thing, but we just had a lot more of them back in the day. And as monoliths got bigger, more complicated, the industry at large said, well, you know, what can we do to address the difficulties around this? And some patterns started to emerge, including breaking them up into more loosely coupled services. And as those services then started to rot and get older and bigger, we kind of did the same thing. We took those services and we broke them up into even more finer grain services. Maybe this time around particular business domains, maybe uh, more stateless. Maybe we think about independently scaling them and automating, uh, automating the deployment of them. And as that continued to progress, we looked to break them down even further, maybe even single functions to solve a very specific type of uh, use case. Uh, so if we take a step back and see all the various approaches that we did, we can see a pattern emerging, right? Every architectural decision you make comes with its own set of pros and cons, but see if you can spot the trend here. We're trying to deliver faster results by breaking up our delivery units into smaller, more scalable units. So that way our applications are easier to fix, build, and scale. Okay, a lot of words here, but we're gonna walk through this. This is a bit of a little small history lesson, but I think it's very interesting to see how the serverless paradigm has evolved over the years. So let's briefly take a look at the history. So starting with 1.0, the first version of AWS Lambdas was released in 2014. Now it wasn't the first version of serverless, you could get it elsewhere, but it was surely one of the most popular. And the reason is because they offered developers the ability to just ship code and they would scale for you, handle all the other stuff. Now this is so compelling for developers. And despite its many limitations at the time, like execution caps, tight coupling with AWS infrastructure, poor local development experience, developers still loved it, still were using it. So if we moved on to 1.5, where AWS Lambdas now weren't the only game in town. There were a lot of other vendors offering these types of functions as a service. And they were all, a lot of them were building on top of Kubernetes. So what Google did is they kind of saw those similarities between all the approaches, took a step back and said, okay, well, how do we bring serverless onto Kubernetes? So Google tried to standardize it by creating a common set of components and objects to do this and thus released the Knative project. Now realizing the opportunities that this could bring in this new momentum behind this standardization, Red Hat joined as a very early founding member. But what's exciting about Knative is that it's more than just the implementation of serverless on Kubernetes. It's really an open standard that a lot of the very vibrant community is contributing to. And this standard actually breaks away from the vendor lock-ins of each of these specific cloud providers. So Knative essentially works by spinning up new containers on demand. So because of this, this not only enables functions, but also enables microservices and basically any container that can be spun up quickly. Now, this brings us to today, 2.0. So Knative came out in about 2018 and is still continuing to push the boundaries of Knative and the serverless paradigm. And with our customers, you know, with all the people that we're seeing that are using Knative and serverless, we're seeing them evolve their architecture into really sophisticated architecture that are truly elastic and really using the cloud for its ability to scale up and scale down quickly. And in this phase, we're seeing serverless essentially become another feature, right? Another way of developing applications. Since in practice, most enterprises will be running a combination of serverless and non-serverless workloads. So microservices, monoliths, functions, all running as containers, 
giving you know, customers, giving organizations, giving groups, giving companies the ability to choose the best tool for the best job. So, Steve, I wanted to ask you about some of the benefits of serverless. Yeah, so I guess it depends on who you ask. So for us developers, it's all about faster time to market. Um, we get to focus on writing code that provides actual business value um, to solve problems, to enhance software, to fix bugs, and so on. Serverless is going to help us abstract away a lot of the deployment complexity, reduces the need to write all that boilerplate so that we can just really focus on providing value uh, through code. For the ops teams, it's going to allow us to offload a lot of deployment concerns and, uh, to the platform. Things like worrying about auto scaling, uh, fault tolerance, thinking about capacity management, patching servers, and, and so on. These infrastructure teams, um, they could be freed up to focus on you know, bigger initiatives because they don't have to worry about all this overhead. And then finally, for the business, it's really cost savings. We don't need to pay for servers that sit idle anymore. It's a pay-as-you-go model, as you mentioned. You spin up and spin down based on demand. So it really just maximizes your resources by minimizing waste. So you know, conversely, like where are the gotchas? Like what are the trade-offs for serverless? Um, you know, testing applications used to be easy, but with serverless, it's a little bit more involved to replicate. Um, you know, the infrastructure locally, like you've got third party dependencies, you've got databases, event streams, and other types of eventing systems that you're going to have to mock out and stub out to really replicate um, for local testing. For operational teams, there's a little bit more complexity. All this um, new functionality, it doesn't just magically appear out of thin air. You're going to have to install the K native components for all this to work. And it, it's pretty big. But you know, when things go wrong, um, these op teams, they're going to need to understand how to troubleshoot these pieces. And then um, you know, the last one I want to mention here is not every application is suitable to become a serverless container. You know, the first invocation of a serverless function, it's going to be the slowest because it's a, it's a cold start. A pod needs to be spun up. The actual image itself needs to be pulled from somewhere and the app needs to initialize from, from cold. So even though you might have some good candidates to be serverless in mind, if the application is too slow or has like long running processes or intensive processing, it may not be a good fit. So John, you know, with that said, what are some good serverless candidates? Yeah, actually let's take a look at a few of the characteristics that all good serverless applications have. So let's start with the upper left here, stateless. Independently and easily scaling things up and down is done much more efficiently and effectively if there's no state to maintain. Right? Things can go away easily. And specific, single purpose and loosely coupled. Again, meaning we can independently scale specific functionality as required by the dynamic and real-time requirements of the system. Next, short and sweet, simple. Now, in terms of complexity, and by complexity, I mean two things. Simple for a developer to reason about and simple in terms of asymptotic complexity and execution limits. Closely related to short and sweet, the application should ideally run briefly and free up those resources it's using when it doesn't need it anymore for other purposes. So Steve, in your experience, what have you specifically seen that are good? Yeah, you know, there's there's tons of good use cases, but here's a real example that I worked on. So I was with an airline company and they've got these things called unaccompanied minors, you know, like kids traveling alone without their their parents. These uh these kids, they get wristbands that get scanned every time they move from one area to another, um, or they change custodies like gate agent to flight agent and, and so on. You know, this type of event doesn't happen too often, um, but when it does, like maybe you have a spike, like maybe you've got a field trip and you've got a lot of kids coming in. Um, you know, this traffic, like you said, it's it's um, it's specific. You know, all it is is just tracking location of, you know, where this uh, this person is. 
It just sends it to a database. It's very short and sweet. Um, there's no state to it. Um, it's burstable. It's not uh, constantly being invoked. So, you know, that just makes it a really good candidate to be a serverless component. Awesome. Yeah, I like that. So conversely, let's see what characteristics where a serverless approach would not be ideal. And a lot of these are kind of the opposite of what you saw. So stateless, we have stateful now. So if you have something like a server-side session or something where, where you're maintaining state server-side, then you'll probably use things like sticky sessions or something. But that becomes very counter to the serverless approach of applications quickly coming and going. Or the next kind of bad pattern is maybe an orchestrator, where if your application is tightly coupled to other services, either a lot of other services call yours directly or your serverless application calls a bunch of others. Right? This means that the tight nature of this coupling is that many components actually need to now be scaled together. And this is also counter to the serverless paradigm. Next, long running and constant implication. I'm going to talk about those together. Long running applications or applications that are evoked often would not be able to take advantage of that serverless nature of rapidly scaling up and scaling down. Because these type of applications actually then start to look like non-serverless applications which might actually be a better approach for them. So this really underscores the point that the serverless architecture isn't for every type of application. It's simply another tool in the toolbox. Some use cases fit really well, and for other use cases, like the ones here, they don't. So Steve, what are some real world bad, uh, real world examples of some bad serverless use cases? Yeah, I think the most famous example right now is from Amazon Prime Video. Um, we, we've seen in the news that they recently converted back to monoliths, and, and that was because they were using a lot of stuck functions, which is a lot of orchestration. Um, they were, you know, saving things to S3 buckets, transferring state, something else was picking it up, and that was very costly because you've got no work overhead, you've got to serialize, deserialize, and so on. So, you know, that was a, a really good example of an orchestrator, uh, you know, trying to do too much and you know, they realized that it probably wasn't the right fit for, for serverless. Yeah, definitely. So um, this is what I'm sort of calling the wall of pain, kind of based on my experiences collected from the field. And, and each of these bricks here, they're kind of sized relatively to how often I, I see them become pain points. Uh, on the left here, you've got error handling and logging in bright red and, and really big bricks here. You know, in, in most cases, um, error handling is, is really important to understand and, and get right because what you do in non-serverless applications is pretty much the same that you do for serverless applications, but you have to be a little bit more defensive to anticipate problems. So you have to do things like build in retries to backend systems or um, set up bulkheads to, to kind of um, isolate problems when they, you know, when they arise. Or, or you know circuit breakers to you know close open and close. Um, logging is really really critical here because the ephemeral state of these um, serverless functions they will spin up and spin down. So you have to log correctly you know verbosely enough. Um, it, it helps a lot if you use structured logging so that you can forward this to a log aggregator and then you can filter by different dimensions and slice and dice that data however you need to. So that's really important to do. Testing is another thing. Just because we're writing smaller pieces of code doesn't mean that we, you know, we ignore testing. We still got to follow good testing practices, writing unit tests, um, integration tests. You know, you, you can still follow the test pyramid. Like those are all still uh, foundations of writing good code. And, and the last one I want to call out here. You know, every one of these bricks could be like a you know deep dive, but just understanding the configurations, there's a lot of things you can change and configure um, for Knative, but a lot of it, it um, out of the box will probably work um, for the majority of cases. But if you start tweaking things and trying to get ahead and, and fine tune things too much, um, you're gonna kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So, you know, those are just some of the ones that I just wanted to highlight. But like I said, all these could be deep dives for like, you know, our sessions. Yeah. Definitely agree. I also wanted to underscore there the dark uh, red ones there, error handling and logging. 
those are the two kind of key ones that you really want to start with. You're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. So don't ignore those and really shift that idea left. Get it right right when you're writing the application instead of after the fact later when you're hunting through all the code and trying to figure out how to instrument it and add air handling and things. Just do it up front. Okay, now time for the demo, the awesome demo we've got here. So hoping we can switch uh, the screens for the powers that be here that control the, uh, uh, the screen sharing. And Steve, what do you got for us today? Yeah, as soon as the screen uh, comes up, I'm trying to share my desktop. Oh, there we, go. there we go. All right. So we are going to pretty much write something from scratch. And there's a, there's a couple of caveats here. You got to have a cluster, obviously. So I've got an OpenShift cluster. Um, and, and the second caveat is the serverless component needs to be installed, uh, which I've already installed. So the very first thing I'm going to do is create a namespace. I'm going to call it DevNation. And, and that's pretty much it, you know, for the cluster side. The next thing that we got to do is, you know, we got to write code, right? So rather than writing code from scratch, I'm going to scaffold a lot of this um, so that I don't need to write the boilerplate. So what I can do, I'll go to Corcus IO, IO and um, click on the start coding button. And for those who are familiar with like the spring initializer, it's the same concept. You come in here, you can set your, your Maven coordinates. So I'll just call this um, serverless uh, dev nation as the artifact name. Um, and, and what we're going to do for this demo is just build a simple REST service. So you can pick whatever flavor of REST, uh, of the REST implementation you want. I'm just going to pick REST easy here. And because I know that I'm deploying to OpenShift, there's a really good OpenShift dependency that's going to streamline a lot of deployment and, and develop uh, deployment um, commands that I usually normally have to manually do. So I'll just search for OpenShift. I'll just add that extension. And just like that, I've got a project that's already set up. You know, I would download this as a zip file and you know, unzip it and open up in my IDE. I've already downloaded it. So uh, I opened it up in VS Code. This is exactly what you would get. Um, there's a couple of scaffold out methods for you already. You know, if you go down to this folder, there's a greeting resource. Um, and then this is like the sample that they give you. Uh, for the sake of the demo, um, I'm going to copy and paste some sample code because, you know, with live demos, anything can go wrong. And I don't want you to see me uh, type a million typos. So let me just copy and paste this. And then I'm going to import my uh, packages here. Take that, that. And don't worry too much about the code. I'm going to dig into this a little bit uh, in a little bit. And for the, um, the OpenShift plugin, there's a couple properties that we need to set. And I'm going to copy and paste that as well. Stick these into the application.properties file. And that's all we need to do to deploy um, a serverless uh, application. But before I dig into the details, let me just kick off the build because building these are going to take, um, you know, maybe three or four minutes. And let me just do that so that we don't have to wait. And while this is building in the background, let's go back and look at the code. So I think. The first thing I want to call out here is if you look at these packages, there is actually nothing Corcus or nothing serverless um, in being imported right now. These are just the standard Java APIs. You know, this is all these Jakarta's that RS. That's just the um, the JAX RS API. Um, and then if you look at the methods themselves, like these are just standard Java methods. Like, you know, it's just a regular REST service. So coming from, um, you know, Spring Boot or, or whatever framework you're, you're used to, you know, it's very easy because you're just writing standard Java. Um, 
a little later when this is deployed, you know, we're going to hit this endpoint and we're going to get a little hello from REST Easy Reactive. Um, I've got another method here to simulate a little bit of delay in processing. Um, you know, I can make this thing sleep for a set amount of time. And then um, I've got a headers endpoint that it's just going to print out some debugging information. You know, the point is there's nothing special here. This could be anything. This is where you would put your business logic to do whatever you need it to do. And then this is um this is almost done. It's going to take maybe another minute or so. But what's happening here? And if I scroll back up, um, I, I I did the Maven package, but I passed in a profile for native. So what that means is. I'm building a Quarkus native executable file. Um, and when I do that, it's going to build um, a, a really compact, a really fast executable um, using, you know, ahead of time compilation. Um, Quarkus gonna, is going to uh, scan through the tree, figure out where all the dead branches are, exclude those classes that it doesn't need. Um, and, and really, you know, it's just going to give you the fastest runtime possible. So when this thing boots up, it's going to be, you know, sub second boot times. Yeah. I also wanted to quickly jump in and add that you talked about Jax RS. I mean, what's really great about Quarkus too, is that the fact that it follows the micro profile specification. So it's really about those st following a standard and using the pieces that we need to get Java onto the web using micro profile. So I think, adhering to that standard, I think is such a cool benefit to allow developers to be able to jump in and start writing regular Java code, just like you said. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So this thing is doing quite a bit of work, the compilation. It does a lot of ahead of time uh, optimizations analysis to be able to really get that binary that it produces against machine code as small and as lightweight as possible. And so we're seeing that now. Now there's a couple of modes we can run, which is in native mode or also the traditional open JDK mode. But I see it's not done, so rock on. Yep. So what happened was, you know, I built an image. Uh, I built the native Im uh, binary. I also built an image. It's already on my cluster now because of the OpenShift um, plugin. So let me go back, go back to my cluster, go back into my main, uh, my project. DevNation. And just to show you, here is my, you know, my image stream, which is my image. And, and because the plugin was configured, the OpenShift plugin was configured to build that route for me. If I go over to the serverless tab here and click on serving, um, it created a route for me. So if I click on this route, it's going to show me the application. But before I do that, let me just show you the pods that are running. Uh, on first deployment, you know, it's going to deploy it. And, and you just saw that it's terminating right now because it didn't see any traffic. Um, and, you know, it's spinning down automatically. So let me go back and actually hit the service now. And, and all I got to do is click here. And, and notice how it's taken, uh, I don't know, maybe that was a second, a second and a half because that's the first invocation of it. So if I go back really quickly and look at the pods, oh, look, you know, this is the new pod that's running and the old one was, was terminating. If I hit this um, hello endpoint, you remember that was, the, that was the, um, the scaffold method that came from the starter code. If I do headers, this is my test endpoint that just prints out a bunch of debugging information. And you know what I want to show you now is the auto scaling feature of, of serverless, um, because this is a really, you know, a really small, really quick app. It can handle a lot of traffic. So there's two things I need to do to sort of artificially bottleneck this. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, um, you know, I'm going to pass it in um, an artificial delay. So I'm going to make the application sleep from between one and two seconds with my load, um, my load testing script. Um, that'll, that'll slow things down a little bit, but it's probably not enough. So the second thing I want to do is 
I want to go and modify the serverless uh, configurations itself. And I want to um, I want to change it so that it can only process fewer concurrent requests um, per container. Right now it's set to zero, which means that it can process as much as it can handle. But I want to artificially bottleneck it so that it so that the um, the machinery thinks that hey I'm under load I need to spin up. So what I'll do I'll just set this to two. You know two is a pretty good number. I can only do two concurrent requests per container. And I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to actually run my load test here. And there's nothing special here. Uh, I'm just using uh, the work to container here. It's just going to curl. Essentially, it's a curl. Uh, I'm going to send it 500 requests. You could use whatever tool you want to here. Um, you could use like a JMeter or a load runner, um, Postman, or, or whatever you want to use. So let me just kick that off. Oh, and, and before I kick that off, let me go back and look at the pods. So we have one pod that's running right now. As soon as I run this command, it's going to run for 30 seconds. Flip over here, and it's automatically scaling. Um, and it looks like a dozen, maybe 18 or so pods. But it, it automatically calculated that, hey, I'm under, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a lot of bursts of traffic, so I'm going to automatically scale up to handle this load. And if I were to, you know, send another load test, it would continue scaling out until it was able to handle it. Uh, so my tests are done, and you know these containers will stick around for probably you know 60 seconds or so, give or take a little bit. Um, once it starts. Um, sitting idle, the you know the the K native component will figure out, hey, you know I don't need all these serverless pieces, so I'll start spinning them down to save resources. Um, while we're waiting for it to spin down, though, I want to show you one other thing. When I change the configurations here, let me just click on uh, this. You know this zero 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 one was the original. I modified it. Uh, the configuration to set the concurrency to two. Um, so it created another revision for me. So every time I modify my serverless configurations, I get a new revision, which makes it really, really easy to roll back if I need to. Or if I was testing maybe new functionality and I want to do some sort of blue, green, or canary deployment, I could do that with these revisions as well. So let me show you that real quickly while we're waiting for the pods to spin down. No, um, actually, some of the pods are spinning down, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. I could set the traffic distribution here via the, um, the UI. I could also do this command line as well. But if I wanted to route maybe 50% you know, of traffic to the new service and 50% back to the original first service, you know, that's where I could do that as well. So I'm not going to do that, but I want to show you, you know, let's look at the pods again. Um, yep, you know, they're, they're all gone. So we spun down, we, we spun up, you know, 18 or so pods, and we spun back down back to zero. And this one is just the build, so that's not the running container. Um, and I think that's all we had for the demo. So let me go back to the slides. Awesome. So I might be a bit biased, but I thought that was a wonderful demo, Steve. Uh, if you'd like to play along at home and see all of that code and have access to that, um, this is the GitHub link here. Um, so you can check it out now. The one that you're going to see here is going to have a bit more code. Uh, we just, Steve, stripped out just the important bits to show today. But on this GitHub repo, you'll see a lot more very functions that do all sorts of interesting dynamic things like that. So recommend everyone to go play with that. Um, next, some resources. If y'all are interested, we have a whole slew of things. I'm going to put it into chat here where all of you 
go to these URLs, play around and click around, get your feet dirty. If there's nothing else that you walk away from this is to try it. You know, go to Quarkus.io, go to one of these links, download the code, set it up, run it locally, and get a feel for it and see how easy it is to get off the ground. All right, now, Q&A. How, how are we doing on time? We have 10 minutes left. So yeah, if there are any questions, um, feel free to put those in the comments window. And uh, sounds like you guys are ready. So uh, we do have one question so far. Um, let's see, this is about serverless on OpenShift. If it's running on Kubernetes, uh, we already pay for the node. Does the serverless model save infrastructure if it is a low usage case? Sure, I'll jump in. We both can, I think we're both able to wanting to answer that. But the idea is, yeah, as you start to scale and as you start to spin, the answer is always it depends. But let me say that as you scale up and you start to get more applications that are serverless, as your workloads potentially are, you know, up and down, kind of sporadic, then you're able to save the cost as you're able to spin down. However, as we talked about earlier with the good and the bad candidates, if you are, however, having a steady state application, it's always running and you have a lot of these applications, then the overhead of the K-native machinery and the added kind of uh, complexity potentially that that brings, we have to learn K-native and learn the configurations that Steve showed today, then it might not be worth it, right? So there's, there's good sides, there's good candidates, and there's bad candidates. So answer is it depends. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It, it depends, but... Um, you know, it's really about optimizing your your capacity, you know, so that you're spinning down, you're allowing other resources to be able to use those resources. So, uh, you know, it's going to depend. Nice. Thanks, guys. Let's see uh, if there's any other questions, feel free to post those now. We'll be able to get to them. We were th so thorough and complete that uh, there are no questions, no, more, no other questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if that's it, then, you know, thank you all for tuning in. You know, we, we're really excited about this technology. And, and like we were saying before, throughout the demo and throughout the presentation, this is not a one size fits all solution. This is not a silver bullet. There's going to be very specific cases for when it's the right fit, but um, you know there, there's always different deployment strategies and and so on. So you know it's just another tool in the toolbox. We uh, it looks like we have one more question here. Any uh, more tips on air handling? Uh, yeah, air handling. There you know there's a lot of patterns that you can follow already. Like you know I, I mentioned retries, uh, and John mentioned micro profile earlier, you know, there are a lot of um, libraries and dependencies with mo uh, micro profile that will let you automatically build in circuit breakers, uh, the bulkheads, the retries. So, you know, I would leverage those APIs and implementations versus trying to write your own. Like, yes, you could write a try catch for loop to kind of do some sort of um, retry, but there's you know there's libraries and APIs that will help you and make that so much easier. Yeah, I want to add on to that too, where adding in those error handling pieces, you could add them in definitely into the code base as you're developing, but also if you're using a platform like OpenShift, OpenShift has the ability for you to orchestrate some of that in the platform. Also closely related to error handling, you didn't ask about it, but log aggregation as well, collecting all the logs, having them indexed, indexed and searchable is another key aspect of that, where these really good practices um, kind of like are even more amplified uh, for these serverless apps. Nice. Well, it looks like that's all our questions. So um, unless anybody has anything else, I think we can wrap things up there. 
Well, thank you, John and Steve, for that great presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the session and got some valuable insights.